Welcome everybody. It's two o'clock on my laptop. So that means it's time to start the ninth webinar from the On the Agenda series created by the European Liberal Forum. Uh, welcome today to a very, very important uh, topic that uh, we want to discuss with our distinguished guests uh, and with our amazing moderator, Beatrice. Um, and yeah, so let's dive right into it. Um, today, we're gonna look at Europe's LGBTIQ equality strategy. And as some of you might know, or I hope all of you know, uh, the 17th of May marked the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia. So it's, it's a very timely discussion. And it's especially timely because on the 11th of March, the European Parliament passed a resolution initiated by the Renew Europe Group declaring the entire EU to be an LGBTIQ freedom zone. So a lot to discuss, a lot to unpack today, and I will not take too much of your time. I will pass the floor to our um, very skilled and experienced moderator, Beatrice Rios, and uh, she, will, she will take you on this journey today. Thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining this afternoon. Indeed, we're going to talk about a very important issue that touch upon many different aspects of EU policy, but also that it affects greatly lives of many Europeans uh, across the bloke. And we want to address them uh, with our two uh, speakers uh, today. I would like to give you first a little bit of uh, the housekeeping rules. This is an interactive session, so we want to hear from you. We want to uh, have a conversation with you. You can leave your questions for our speakers speakers in the Q&A chat and I will make sure that I threw it into the conversation. I have many questions myself because I'm a journalist but I'm always open to hear from you. I definitely want you to be part of this conversation today on this very important topic. You also need to know that we're live on Facebook so if any of your colleagues couldn't join the session but would like to watch you can send them the link and uh, they will be able to follow uh, this chat today as well. Now as Andre mentioned before the European Commission presented its first, first ever LGBT TQI uh, strategy, and this has opened the debate about all the many issues that needs to be addressed at European level when it comes to the rights of this community, and all the issues that we have seen all across, across member states. It's indeed very important, very symbolic that the European Parliament decided to declare the European Union an LGBTQI um, uh, freedom zone after what we have seen in countries like Poland and Hungary declaring themselves free zones for these people, uh, which all the consequences in terms of violence and aggressions that we have seen for those communities indeed. There are a lot of issues as well that are related to the labor market, to family reunification, a lot of small uh, pieces of legislation that has a great impact in the lives of many, many Europeans across the EU, as I said before. I don't want to take much of your time because I definitely want to hear from our speakers. Now, today we were expecting to have the member of the European Parliament from the, the Renew Group, Ramona Estrugariu, but unfortunately she couldn't join because uh, she had a lot of work to do at the European Parliament. So today uh, we're going to have a video from her with a very strong message. So here it is. The European Union is a space of rights and freedoms. That's why every single person in the European Union, and I would say in the world, has the right to live whom they want, has the right to assume an identity without being discriminated against or hated or marginalized. We declared the European Union recently an LGBTIQ freedom zone. And this is precisely why I am calling on every single actor on the public scene in Europe to take this responsibility and step forward for protecting fundamental rights. Anywhere and everywhere in the world, we need to share this responsibility of respecting each other and of sticking to rights and freedoms the way they are defined in the fundamental charter for human rights and in all of the legislative instruments that we have across the world. I stand with you and I truly wish that one day all of us will share 
this common knowledge, understanding and responsibility of declaring the uni union and the world through acts and uh, actions an LGBTIQ freedom zone. Very powerful message. A lot of work uh, needs to be done indeed. And we are going to be talking about all the many things that we still need to do in Europe to make sure that that's actually uh, a freedom zone uh, for the LGBT community um, in the European Union. So I would like to first give the floor to Ralph Guion Froelich, who is the president of the LGBTI Liberals of Europe. So please, Ralph, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Ralf Fröhlich. I'm the president of LGBTI Liberals of Europe, which is a network of party political LGBTI groups around Europe. So we are linked to liberal political parties and try to both influence them, but also give them a helping hand because most of our political allies and partners are actually very um, supportive of the LGBTI agenda, uh, but they need sometimes somebody who helps them in developing policies. In this respect, we also have looked into the new strategy, the Commission strategy, which actually has been a tremendously big step forward. Uh, the very point that it is the first strategy that the European Commission is putting forward is, of course, important. But also, it actually has a very high quality. Um, it was prepared by our Liberal Commissioner Vera Jourova in the last uh, Commission. So we already had a dialogue with her. We knew it would go in a good direction but it was it was very lucky that the new commissioner coming in who is not from the liberal group but uh, still a super supportive uh, politician Helena Dali from Malta uh, it was really a, a very lucky coincidence that she took over and she's super engaged in these topics and brought the uh, strategy into the final uh, goal and actually adopted until now, we often had the problem that the European Commission and European institutions were hiding behind the competence question. They basically were saying uh, there's very little the European Union can do about LGBTI issues because most of the topics like family law, like social law and so on, are national competence, member state competence. Uh, but this uh, strategy actually looked into where can the European Union do something and where they can't, how do they, uh, how can it be uh, supportive? But the most important is actually that it uses its normative force. Uh, as some people said already, uh, the speaker said already that the, uh, it is important to define the European Union as a space, as an area in the world where LGBTI rights are respected. Uh, and to make clear that this is a cornerstone of the European identity as much as other civil and human rights. I think this normative, this very, very clear message is maybe even the most important in this strategy, but it also has uh, a lot of good concrete points. On the sharp proposals, it's, uh, it's, con it, it's in the uh, area where the European Union has a good competence or uh, actually decisive competence it's the inner market and the free movement within the inner market. So here the commission is very clear in saying that uh, the free movement also includes the free movement of families and spouses. And then we talk about family and spouses, we talk about all families and all spouses uh, to make it sure that if you are a parent in one country, independently of how this parenthood is established through adoption, through surrogacy, uh, in a rainbow family or in a traditional family or in a patchwork family or however uh, that when you come to another EU member state your parenthood will be respected and not uh, deleted. Uh, we actually had these cases it's incredible imagine yourself if you come in a situation where you as a family move and suddenly one of the parents is not a legal parent any longer uh, cannot bring the kids to hospital, cannot pick them up from kindergarten, has no rights when the kids are moved by the spouse somewhere else, for example. Um, so it's, of course, an incredible discrimination that, that we cannot accept and that the European Union has found a good leverage to work about. The same about spouses, so marriage and, and partnerships. Uh, also here the principle that uh, the partnership or marriage in one country has to be respected in the other country. 
And in this context, maybe one of the sharpest sentences in the, in the strategy is said when the commission says, we will take legal action if necessary. Uh, so here it's very clear the commission is seeing its, its power and it, it, it is determined to use it. There are uh, quite a number of other areas where the competence is with the national states, with the member states, uh, culture, family law, uh, sports, health, uh, employment, all, uh, many other topics. But the commission here has used some fantasy to uh, still try to influence these topics. So we, they use a lot of words like research, like supporting the member states in putting up these policies, like uh, comparing, finding best practices. Uh, so basically the commission has decided to put pressure on the member states that are lacking behind in defining uh, LGBTI rights in the fields where there is national competence. There is a risk with the strategy now that we have a, a turned around situation that now some member states might hide behind the European Commission. You know, they might say, oh, the European Commission has a wonderful policy now, so we don't have to do anything any longer. Uh, and uh, to this, we have, have to be very clear that still a lot and actually most of the questions have to be dealt with on the national level. Uh, and we, we cannot uh, fall short of keeping up the pressure on the national level. And especially, um, Beatrice, you have mentioned it already, there are some countries that we, we uh, have a rollback, basically. Uh, we uh, are falling behind a stage where we already had reached certain successes. And what's even more sad maybe is that we see that uh, especially Hungary is putting out legal proposals that are copied and paste uh, produced by other countries now. So uh, governments in neighboring countries uh, take the, the Hungarian model as a role model for their own legal proposals. Um, so we see a kind of clash of ideas here, uh, how to deal with these topics. And there, from our point of view, uh, the, the, the liberal uh, point is very clear. For example, when it comes to family, there is this fight. Some countries now want to define families as being only with a married mother and father and their biological kids. In many countries, uh, less than half of the children grow up in these kind of families. More than half of the children grow up in all kinds of other family uh, types in patchwork families, in sing with single mothers, single fathers, uh, in rainbow families, and in adopted family or, or in families with adopted children, all kind of um, combinations. So we as liberals say, if you really want to be on the children's side, which a lot of the conservative opponents to LGBTI rights say that they are, then you have to make sure that all families are respected and safe in their legal frameworks. That is how you create uh, good circumstances for the children, not by putting question marks behind their actually families, how they are established. So from a liberal point of view, it's, it's up to the families to decide how they want to live. It's not the state that should define what's a family and what's not. In, um, as I said, like the, the, the wording of this, of this whole document, the EU strategy, the commission strategy is quite liberal. Uh, there are a few tiny things that maybe come from other families, uh, but they are relatively marginal. There is, uh, for example, the, uh, there is a whole chapter on social companies and how social companies can, uh, can promote LGBTI rights. In my perspective, that's, that's true, but of course, it's uh, the, the most important question is that the whole labor market, all companies uh, join into this effort. It's not like just a small niche of so-called social companies. Uh, on important topics that they take up, uh, except from what I already said, free movement, uh, family, uh, I think there is one very interesting for the future, it's artificial intelligence. Uh, and maybe the EU can actually also define a normative uh, force here. How does artificial intelligence relate to LGBTI rights? It's for example, in the algorithms that are developed, 
uh, in face recognition. There is research going on uh, linking face recognition with the recognition of supposed sexual orientation. So a machine will decide if you are considered uh, gay or lesbian or straight. Uh, for example, there is serious research going on on this. There is commercial applications for this. Um, we put the question like, why would you want to know? What's the reason behind this? Uh, isn't there a better use for artificial intelligence than trying to detect the sexual orientation of a person or even the sex of a person, the gender of a person? Uh, so, so there is a, a, a big topic coming up that the, the commission already addresses. And I think the European Parliament is addressing is, it as well. And it's like a think tank like ELF would be a perfect uh, place to look into this future topic and already make sure it's not running away before we have uh, thought about it. There is the rule of law mechanism, uh, which is the, the new mechanism uh, to uh, ensure the rule of law in all member states. It's not a very strong mechanism in the end. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the German government uh, was in the end uh, not, not holding up to the, to the higher um, uh, positions here. Uh, so the rule of law mechanism is not a super strong one, but it's there. And I think we need to monitor that it also includes uh, LGBTI rights as one of the aspects of uh, rule of law. Uh, it's not so easy from a legal point of view, but it would be a pity if this falls out of what is being done, what will be done in the future, because it is a leverage on especially Poland and Hungary that we potentially can use. Just to, to conclude, there is two uh, things that uh, I could say are missing in this document, um, or of all the things that could be missing, it's only two. Uh, so I think uh, they, as I said, I really think they did a, a great job in putting this paper together. Um, what, 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 what I missed is the whole area of trade agreements. So EU trade agreements with third countries and how they uh, include LGBTI rights as a condition of uh, these uh, trade agreements. This is actually be done in reality. Uh, for example, with Georgia, where uh, I was present at the first uh, Pride, and uh, the, the, it's it's a violent experience, I can tell you. Uh, but the only the only light in the tunnel is that the European Union has made sure that the Georgian government has to respect certain. Uh, basic levels here and has to protect the community, at least to a certain extent. So these, uh, these, these paragraphs and trade agreements are super efficient in, in these countries and the LGBTI communities and organizations in these countries are, are very grateful that there is this one leverage to their government uh, that is powerful. So we shouldn't forget about them in the future as the European Union has done them in the past as well. And the last point that's maybe missing is a clear monitoring. There is no, no um, a clear plan in this strategy how to monitor the success. Uh, so there's a lot, that, like many things they want to do, which is very good. But on the way, it's a five year years plan. We also should look you know, into what the successes are and how the strategy maybe has to change, uh, which if the European Commission doesn't do it itself, it's of course an important task for us as civil society following on the uh, implementation of this strategy. Thank you so much, Ralph, for that overview of uh, the uh, uh, strategy. Indeed, it was very interesting to hear about all the different ways in which actually the commission, as you said, can move from hiding on competence to go and move into political will. We, we're going to talk about that. I have many questions about also the question of the, the role of the ECG, because we have seen a few rulings that were not as strong as we wish uh, for these for these questions, right? But we were going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, before, I would like to give the floor to our next speaker. She's Bianca Ningoff, and she's the co-chair of Workplace Pride. So please, Bianca, you have the floor. Wonderful. Thanks, Beatrice, for introducing me. And thanks, Ralph, for giving this good overview of the, uh, the European strategy. Uh, yes, my name is indeed Bianca Nayov. I'm the co-chair of Workplace Pride uh, in daily life, managing a, an organization as a director, but now focus on Workplace Pride. And actually, 
would like to introduce you a little bit more in what we as an organization do. Um, and maybe a first thought I have already, uh, listening to what you say, Ralph, um, Workplace Pride represents a lot of companies who all together want to create this workspace in which LGBTIQ plus people feel safe. So I, I already have some thoughts about how could the European Commission start monitoring or what lessons could they maybe learn if you look at it from a business perspective? I think that's a very interesting uh, way in how businesses maybe might uh, might provide the examples. Let me try and share my screen with you and walk you through a little bit through who we as an organization uh, are. Um, so we are the international platform for LGBTIQ plus inclusion uh, at, at work. Um, let me see whether, sorry for always struggling a little bit with the techniques in these virtual days. So we, we are a membership organization and I must say um, the, the importance of diversity and inclusion and specifically for the LGBTI uh, plus Q plus community has risen and, and it's amazing to see how many new members are, are joining our organization uh, and lately. So as I said, the importance is, is rising and although you would expect that due to COVID-19 happening, maybe budgets would be cut, you see that a lot of companies joining us and, and really working on this and maybe even the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually showed the, um, the need for also collaborating uh, on, on diversity and inclusion for the LGBTIQ plus community uh, specifically. Um, so just realize how much time of your life you spend in the works, at the workspace, that's about 33%. So it's important that you feel safe there, that you feel uh, recognized for who you, who you are and you can actually bring every aspect of who you are uh, to, to the work floor. I always like uh, the way how people phrase it that, um, and it, it, it was also the case for me that by, by opening up about this subject at the work floor, it's like your life turning from black and white into to full color. And that's what it really also did, did for me. So the, if you look at the percentage of productivity and productivity loss, which, which you see if you can't be your, bring your true self to work, it's about 30%, which is huge. And if you think about it from a business perspective, very, very important. Um, so it, it will as, it will impact you during your working life, but obviously also out of your working life. So the impact is, is huge, which is again also of importance to to, to your business. Um, well, you know, Europe in in that sense, compared to many other parts of the world, is still really a good place to live. I would dare to say, although um, from my personal opinion, you've seen it. Maybe even I live in the Netherlands. Even there, you've seen it. Um, moving backwards recently. So bringing this subject to the agenda also as a business uh, is of vital importance. Um, so there's, there's still 70 countries in the world where homosexuality or LGBTIQ plus, it's, it's criminalized. And um, this is what I believe businesses play an important role in also working towards, again, allowing everybody everywhere in the world to, to be themselves. Um, so what do we do as an organization? As Workplace Pride, we work with our members to help them to be more inclusive with, the, with their policies, with their practices. Uh, we provide tools, advice, expertise, but we also allow them to share tools and expertises with one, one another, to connect with one another. Uh, and not only about sharing these tools and expertises, but also sometimes in countries where, for example, Singapore, where being part of the community and acting like it is, is criminalized. So how can you create this safe space for your employees within your organization, within your business, but also at least without your business by allowing, well, providing them with the opportunity to connect with other members of the community outside of work, but within the other communities where, where you know there it's free to be your, your bring your true self to work as, as well. So that connection is also something we get back from our members is very, very valuable. And maybe putting it into the perspective of what's happening into Europe and towards government, this is also where businesses can join hands in working together towards governments where um, well, it's to, to really promote and, and, and stress how important it is also within a government and within a country to, uh, to, to yeah, to, to promote and, and, and to have people feel, feel safe uh, within the community. Um, 
So one of the tools, and I just heard you say, Ralph, and that's what made me think of how are we going to measure this? And one of the, that's the same question we received from a lot of the companies. So how can we measure progress and how do we know uh, where, what to work, work on? Um, so we answer that question actually in two ways. So one, we have a, a global benchmark, uh, which we are upgrading every year because there's obviously new evidence and new, new surveys coming out and new knowledge coming out. But we set a standard and via that standard, companies can measure how they are moving forward with regard to LGBTIQ plus policies and practices, specifically at the work floor. And they know can see how they benchmark uh, as compared to other companies, but also where they for themselves on a yearly basis monitoring this, how they can improve. Um, so this is just a, as, a, as, an, as an example from, from one of the companies. And it is either the policy as mentioned before, but it's also about employee networks and how can you move forward there. Uh, inclusion and engagement, which obviously is less, less much more difficult to measure, uh, but it's one of the ways in which we, we try and at least measure it due to a questionnaire, which they, a survey, which they fill in each, each year and really support them in, in also the ones who, who really um, show good results in this benchmark, how can they share what they're doing with, with others who are a little bit lower on the benchmark and, and want to really upgrade their performance on that. Um, one of the other ways in how we do it is we, we have developed a, a learning and development program, very extensive program of 10 modules, uh, which is specifically for, for our members, um, which really allows you to, again, grow in that maturity, this LGBTIQ plus maturity as an organization. It's, a, it's sometimes about very, very little things. So it's about the inclusive language which you use, even in hiring people in, in, your, in your vacancies in the way how, and, and how do you connect to your potential future employees. But it's also, again, the, 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 the include, how do you behave as an organization within a country, for example, within Europe, um, beyond your, your employees? How do you promote yourself there? How do you brand your product? So that's also towards the, the clients. Um, how, how are you working with LGBTIQ plus inclusion on, on that aspect? And obviously, uh, cultural sensitivity is one of the other things which we address as a global organization, uh, having organizations working in many, many countries in, in, in the world. So how do you bear in mind the, the cultural sensitivities which, which are um, connected to, to the subject? Um, this is something which we have started with uh, quite recently, but very, very good feedback on um, on how on, on actually supporting companies in, in moving forward on the in the field of LGBTIQ plus. Um, just to give you an idea on, on global outreach and activities, uh, and it's good that you mentioned uh, Hungary, um, Ralph, and we just actually last Monday on Idahot Day, so the, the Global Day Against Homophobia, we, we have had a conference in, in Budapest, and I'm happy to share a little bit more on that later on. Um, so many events coming up. We have our, our own um, events with Copenhagen, a global uh, event is, is coming up. And, and as you can see, we've moved to many countries also where um, where you can't be, well, it's criminalized to, to be part of the, of, of the community and acting on it. Um, and this is where we always also find, work together closely with governments, and in this case, the Dutch government, uh, providing this safe space uh, to, for us to hold these events and um, to allow people together. Um, I think something unique is we also have a chair together with Leiden University doing specific research uh, on uh, organizational psychology related to LGBTIQ+. Uh, this different dedicated programs working on women and LG at the workplace, women belonging to the community, academia, young people, very, very important. Um, we have had several webinars over, over time. Um, related to workplace, related to uh, including new generation, and quite recently also one on intersectionality, which I believe is fascinating as well, because it's not only you being LGBTIQ+, it might be you also belong to the, the Black Lives Matter community, through to whatever communities, your unique self, and how do we bring, without being becoming exclusive, how do we promote inclusion, and how can we uh, all work together on, on that? Um, that's it from my side for now. There's many, much more to say, but maybe again, reflecting on what's happening in the EU now with the strategy, 
Um, I always like to, these businesses, which are very, very important in the econo economics of a country, um, it's businesses and also being present in different countries around the world, experiencing different situations related to LGBTIQ+. And I think also for the European Commission, with the, the, the good strategy now in place, uh, let's find the support from, from businesses how to, to, to further work on and elaborate on this strategy and really make it work. Um, and it would be good in the upcoming conversation to see how we, uh, how, how businesses can play a role in there. And obviously, Workplace Pride is a foundation supporting those businesses in, uh, in acting as such. Thank you so much, Olenka. I think it's, it's a very nice way to actually start the conversation because the feeling that I'm getting from the both of you is that, as in many other issues, it's very important to have collaboration between different sides of the uh, policy making, not only those who are involved directly in the, making, in the decision making, but also grassroots movements, uh, civil society organizations that feed a lot into those policies and those texts. And I was also thinking about the question of representation because it's something that often can create a problem. And, and it's interesting from the perspective of Ralph, who can to try to bring that gap between the parties as a whole and the community itself. Um, so I was wondering if you could give me a little bit of feedback on that. I, I First of all, I would like to recall people that they can ask questions. We have a question and I'm going to address it later. But please, uh, if there is anything you would like to ask to our speakers, uh, make sure that you do it. We have around half an hour to have this discussion. And I am, I'm sure that uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting things that you're wondering about. So yeah, uh, maybe uh, maybe Blanca, you would like to follow up on these and, and, and on the role in particular that businesses could play um, in bringing this debate forward. Yeah, yes. And, and maybe then um, what I promised to come back to the Hungar Hungary uh, um, session, which we had quite last Monday. Um, and I have to look at some of the notes because I'm not good at remembering numbers, but but. It's obviously for businesses, I would almost say numbers are important in that sense. It's in, And being inclusive makes common business sense in, in many, many ways. As I said, it's a, um, a lowering of productivity and of effect, effectiveness of, of your employees by, by 30%. Um, that's quite a lot. Uh, but also uh, addressing the younger generation again, um, if people want to work for you as an organization, you have to be inclusive, and especially the younger generation is very, very much focused on, on, on that. But also here, um, as a member of the European Union, Hungary plays an important role for, for investors on whom it really heavily depends economically. So um, foreign direct investments account for 90.6% of the country's GDP in 2019, according to, to the World Bank. So, but all of its neighboring countries had foreign direct investments of less than 5% in the same year. So this is very important for the country to, to retain those investors. Um, but if you look at the message the investors bring, um, ESG, environmental social governments are very, very important issues. The social bid in it actually addresses the LGBTIQ plus bid in this. This is also where for companies, again, is very, very important. So there's a reason also for the, the Hungarian government and I uh, think to, to focus on it. But for businesses, for sure, it's very important. So do they want to keep doing business in Hungary if this is really getting it becoming an issue? That's one of the things which actually was, was addressed there. Um, uh, yeah, and, and especially what I said also, do businesses allow Hungary um, and do they want to continue doing business in Hungary when, when there's laws, uh, when there's the LGBTIQ plus community is not fully um, taken into account within the country itself and they can't be freely themselves at work. So one of the things which came out of the, uh, of the conference. It's very interesting because I think it's probably the first time that I'm addressing this issue as making economic sense, but it actually does because those companies are not uh, inclusive and open. They actually are missing in a lot of opportunities because there are a lot of professionals that might not want to work with them because they don't feel comfortable. It makes sort of sense. Uh, maybe Ralph, um, a follow up on this question of needing to ensure representation of the community to make sure that the policies are actually adapted to the challenges that you're facing. Uh, yes, and I, I just started with a comment on what just uh, was, was said. I think it's not only a question of companies maybe missing out. We have seen that some companies get a specific uh, advantage in the competition by actually being open to, to uh, all people, basically, and giving them a safe space, especially in countries where there is a challenging situation. Uh, com like smart companies have an enormous advantage by accessing smart people that 
that happen to be gay or lesbian or or intersex or uh, but uh, and 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 feel that if they can work in a company that gives them a safe space, the loyalty will be will be very high to to that company. Um, so so there is not only avoiding disadvantages; it's actually a competitive advantage uh, in 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 many cases, especially like in countries like like Hungary. On the on the representation, there is actually. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly difficult discussion um, because we, we all over Europe, we get a discussion on identity politics uh, saying like, if we say we want to make sure that a certain group is represented, we, we are very quickly confronted with an opposition saying, but this is identity politics. You, you put this group against another group, uh, for example. Uh, and we, we very strongly say that we, it's not what we are doing. Uh, we never want to put one group against another. We, as, as liberals, our idea is that if every individual can live their full potential, the whole society will have an advantage of that as well. So it's not about this one person having an advantage over another person by being represented, for example, but by giving everybody access in, and uh, non-discriminatory access to uh, in influence and and economic power and so on in society, we make society better for everybody. Everybody will profit from that. Thank you so much uh, for that. Indeed, um, uh, there is a question coming from the uh, from the audience. Um, when you read uh, the rule of law conditionality agreement, it it pretends to be limited to the financial interests of the union. In practice, however, expectations are much higher. How do you read this agreement? I, I'd like to make just myself a, a clarification: is that there are two different things here. One thing is the uh, rule of law mechanism that is linked uh, to the EU funds. Another thing is the wider uh, uh, monetary mechanism linked to the Article 7, which is a full discussion about actually respecting principles and human rights within the union. But maybe, Ralph, you would like to comment on this one? Yeah, I, I think I hinted a little, a little bit on this when I presented that the rule of law mechanism, uh, which is a sharper instrument than, than the other one, is limited to the, to the auditing, basically, of the funds of the EU. Uh, but that's why the, the, the parts on the funds in the strategy are quite smart, because uh, in this strategy of the Commission, it's very clear that EU funds should always be distributed in a non-discriminatory way. So it's one of the criteria that the EU now is including into the distribution of their project funds, for example, into the member states. So if the member states cannot follow up on that, they're actually breaching EU law. And then the rule uh, of law mechanism, theoretically, can be applied on that. But we will have to see how it's practically applied, because of course the resistance from certain countries is very high that uh, the EU will be able to, for example, block funds for them if they don't respect uh, certain, certain criteria. It's interesting as well because even before the the rule of law mechanism was launched and the whole debate was running about these, we saw already the Commission stopping funds to some of those cities that decided to declare themselves LGBTQ free zones. So, you know that there is there is a political debate as well about to what extent the Commission can actually act. With linked uh, to the question that I had before about to to what extent you actually see that. Um, moving from hiding behind the question of competence and moving into more political willingness can actually have an impact because you were mentioned as well that there is no monitoring of the strategy and we know that some of the initiatives that the commission is putting forward might not actually be taken in award by member states so do you really see that these a strategy can actually be effective in ensuring uh, at least less discrimination if not more rights uh, for the LGBT community uh, yes, I, I think it can be effective, especially because now at the, at the negotiation tables, it's not a few progressive countries uh, and a number of countries that don't speak up against uh, a few countries that speak up strongly against anything that's related to LGBTI rights. Uh, now we also have the commission speaking up, you know, it has committed itself to speak up, so it's not a neutral uh, a neutral ground any longer. There is a norm that's defined. And I think that's a step forward. But then I, I also fear that 
it, we see that in some political movements, the criticism towards the European Union is linked now to homophobia. Mm -hmm. Basically, you can see that uh, political movements, especially from the right, that that criticize the EU as colonialist, as uh, arrogant, as a waste of money, and so on. They also uh, include homophobic uh, uh, ideas into that, saying that you know it, the it, the LGBTI rights agenda is an ideology that the EU wants to put over our heads. So we have to resist. We have to defend the traditional family. Otherwise, the EU will make everybody gay and will make everybody like you know kind of these kind of strange ideas. Uh, but but they are they are put into concrete. Com 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 concrete connections with the um, uh, with the EU criticism. So there is there is a risk in that uh, where the we are on the same side again. The European Union has to raise its profile and its credibility, uh, and we at the same time have we have to take these discussions. We have to support the the local communities in all the countries so they can take these discussions because uh, we have had similar situations in countries that are very progressive today, only 10 years ago. Yeah, and this is maybe where, where business is coming, actually, um, being part of society and, and again, where you spend 33% of your time. But also, as you stated, Ralph, where um, it's not only the employees, it's also maybe the products which businesses um, produce and, and how do you communicate through those project products also in the countries where um, the community doesn't feel, doesn't feel safe. So, in, in commercials or, or whatever expressions which are possible from a business perspective, how to do that. And if I see, for example, at Workplace Pride, again, how we together with our, our members do that is that we have had conferences uh, over th in 13 countries all around the world, including us set before Kenya and, and Singapore, uh, even in Russia and, and India, where, where it was criminalized and in India was decriminalized in 2018, obviously. But, but the reason why we have those conferences in, in those countries where it's culturally difficult to be part of the community is to also give support to the local community, but also, and, and, and at the same time uh, allow visibility actually in, in, in that sense. And um, so I, I think there's a role for businesses to play in this and, and an opportunity also for, I think, the European Commission to work together with businesses um, to, to really connect with the with society in the widest sense, people maybe also opposing to LGBTIQ plus, but just showing it makes common business sense and it makes common sense to to allow this this to be and support it actually. Absolutely, you both mentioned something that uh, indeed worries me a lot, and is the fact that we have seen backlash in many countries that were very pro LGBTQ rights. Um, I am personally from Spain and I have seen that in the past few years, being a country that was very much advanced in this issue, uh, we saw that with the rise of the far right and numbers of uh, of groups that have been pushing for a nomophobic agenda, we are seeing that uh, there is a lot of pressure on the government to back down on all the achievements that we saw over the past few years. Um, I also saw that uh, in the latest report by uh, the uh, European agency that looks into human rights in the EU, there was an increase on the harassment and the violence against the LGBTQ community in Europe over the past few years. And this is a very worrying trend, considering that Europe indeed is one of the best places in the world to be a member of the LGBT community. So I was wondering, first of all, where do you think is this back backlash coming? And second of all, what do we need to do? to tackle those issues and to fight back? And to what extent do you see uh, the US strategy being part of this conversation? Yeah, I can, I can answer this first, maybe Ralph, on behalf of what, how I see the role of companies in there. Maybe you can then build upon, upon that. Because um, yes, indeed, I even being lucky enough to, fortunate enough to live in the Netherlands, which is uh, um, was one of the first country to, to allow um, same-sex marriage, actually. Um, I think in general, I'm taking it a little bit wider than also having had the intersectionality webinar quite recently. I think polarization is something we see happening globally. And um, recognizing all the differences which we, we have and the, how different we are all as human beings, I think as soon as you're 
not part of the uh, of of the, the 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 mainstream kind of either yeah or or the perceived superior or mainstream um, identity, um, then we are you are being marginalized and 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 for for, for whatever reason I, I really don't know because I simply personally also don't understand. But I think the solution in that, which uh, which I really try and, and find also within workplace pride, what we do is collaborating with other organizations uh, working on other ident- other ways of how you can identify. So we're closely collaborating with Catalyst, for example, women in the workplace. In our recent webinar, Intersectionality, we, we very specifically also addressed the Black Lives Matter and the, the, the crimin- discrimination against the Asian community there. And how can we join hands as, as organizations promoting, uh, working on different, different identities? How can we work together there and actually celebrate the uniqueness of which we are? And you see that same, similarly happening within organizations, um, addressing diversity with, um, but then working towards inclusion. So how that I think that, and the working towards inclusion bit is where it becomes very important. And again, having this, this strategy of the European Commission in place really supports companies in their endeavor within Europe as well to do that. And obviously slowly working towards the rest of the world to, to, to their adopt it as well within their DNI strategies as a company. Indeed, again, the important role that business play being a uh, big part of the society. Thanks for that, uh, Bianca. Maybe, uh, Rob, you would like to comment on this as well? Yeah, when we when we have this question on uh, backlashes, I, I sometimes take the example of uh, um, after the fall of the wall, there was a famous book called The End of History. Uh, because we thought, or some people thought, uh, some philosophers thought that liberal democracy and market economy now have won forever. Uh, and if, of course, it turned out it didn't. Uh, even liberal democracy and market economy are challenged again, and they are maybe challenged more than ever uh, now uh, by, uh, like, from different angles. Um, and the same happens to to minority rights, not even only LGBTI rights. It happens to my, minority rights, and it also happens to women's rights. Um, I, I used to say, like, women, the women's rights movement is the big sister of the LGBTI rights movement. Without women rights being respected and being progressed, LGBTI rights will never have a chance uh, because they challenge the same power uh, structures uh, uh, in different ways. So, in the very moment when we see women's rights being challenged uh, in uh, countries from, from extreme religious groups, from extreme national groups, we will always know that also LGBTI rights will come as a shadow to that being being challenged as well. Uh, so these are like the fights are are connected, and the risk of backlash is always there. Um, it, it it will never go away. So so we, we we will have to keep up guards. We'll have to keep our arguments sharp. We'll have to take the debates, uh, and that's again I come back to something I said before on identity politics, um, where. Uh, we as liberals can be very critical to some of the of the ways uh, LGBTI topics are discussed on the political left with a kind of indignation. As soon as somebody says something, uh, uh, people on the left can be very indignated and not talk to the other side any longer. Uh, our approach is we should keep talking. We need to talk. We need to make our arguments because we, like, we have to be convinced we have the better arguments. So uh, like as well for liberal democracy and market economy, and for for women's rights and LGBTI rights as well. About that, let me let me just do a follow up. I'm going to recall our our participants as well that they can still ask questions. That we have ten minutes left, so if they want to ask something, uh, now's the time. So a little bit out of follow up. You were mentioning these questions about identity politics and how how do you address this conversation? Because sometimes I do feel that indeed we need a shift into the way we talk about these. Um, because sometimes, as you said before, it feels like um um like having LGBTQ rights recognized, it means that someone else is going to lose their rights, whereas here it's just about actually ensuring that we all are the same. So how did you change this conversation that we have ongoing and where do you think that conversation should go? Yeah, the one, yeah, again, on answering from a business perspective, I think, um, 
the, what I said before, the way it is addressed, it makes common business sense. Um, and whether it's LGBTIQ plus or whether it's 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 your gender or, or whatever it is of the many identities which you, you have, um, for a business it is important that you can be your full self at work in, in the many, many, many ways and you don't feel restricted, obviously. That's the that's and that's the way how to start a conversation. Um, that was the way when I was an employee for an organization. I have the the, the the honor of leading an organization now, and that's the way how how we have framed our our DNI policy in this way. Um, so it's not starting the conversation from from who you love or or how you identify or what's the color of your skin or or in whatever way. It is simply about how do you function best, even with your different ways of thinking. Some people think different and, and approach their work differently. So um, I really try to start within the organization. I, I have the honor to lead, but I also see that similarly within other organizations. So how can we use the full potential of who you are as a person and start a conversation from that perspective? Looking at investors within organizations, and I would also say businesses moving to specific countries again, that's also how can you ensure that your employer, apart from being part in the day job, in that time being in the office space, which is your, your confinement, and how can you create a safe space there? But it's also the, the, the time outside of work and, and, and what role can you as a company take um, towards the government of a company, maybe as, of a country, and maybe as a group of companies, and that's what we try and do as Workplace Pride as well. Set one, create a safe space for the employees within a country, but also start a conversation and show what's the value of bringing your full self to work and also how will the country benefit from that action. So that's the type of conversations uh, we are trying to really um, invigorate within Workplace Pride. Absolutely. Uh, maybe just to conclude before we finish, um, I would like to ask you uh, from your different perspectives, what do you think are the main um, elements of the of the EU strategy that should be pushed as much as possible in the coming years? What do you think is the genuinely most important aspect of the strategy that you need absolutely to see uh, progressing? Maybe you would like to start, Ralph? Um, yes, uh, I, I think as there is basically only one area in the strategy where the EU has full competence, that's the one we really want to see them in the game, and that's the free movement, uh, making sure that partnered and married couples and families, rainbow families, have free movement in Europe. And that means with everything, with taking their insurances with them, with being able to take in healthcare in every country, uh, with being able to inherit, with being able to take care of their kids, everything that's related to family and, and marriage life should be mirrored in every country. Um, and that's also the potential of the European Union to actually open marriage for other for EU countries where there is no marriage yet. Because in my dream world, in a few years, we, we could make it possible that, for example, a Bulgarian couple can go to Denmark, get married, get back to Bulgaria and be respected as a married couple there. Um, it's of course like a way around, but it would at least open, open uh, possibilities. And as we have seen in other countries, once possibilities are open and people see that their world is not crashing because there is a, a same-sex couple marrying, uh, then uh, normally society moves very quickly in that direction, uh, you know, not fearing as much uh, any longer. So that's the one. And then the other one is the be like, keep up the normative, normative uh, work, making sure that it's not only empty words when we say that the EU is a free zone for uh, uh, LGBTI uh, people, but, but it, it has to be uh, an, an ever standing, like a, 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 an aspect that's always present. Um, otherwise it will be forgotten quickly. Thank you so much for that very, very powerful message. Maybe Bianca, you would like to give uh, a last word on this issue. Actually, I build upon what Rolf has just said. Um, I think marriage equality definitely is, is very important because it's about bringing your partner to a country where you might be transitioned to because of work. And I think that's a very, very important or where you 
a company would like to transition you to, to work because that's that's the conversation you're going to have then. Um, and the economic advantage um, for companies just to allowing people to be their full self at work, that's in the end also a, a, um, yeah, an economic advantage for, for the country in whichever place the, the company is, 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 um, is, is positioned. So I think those those two would be very important for me for the European Commission to to, to bear that in mind. And I think this is also a role where your Europe as a continent uh, can play a, sh- a leading role, a showcasing role to the rest of the world, um, showing that also within traveling within different countries, uh, it can happen, and and you just can be yourself wherever you are. Let's lead that conversation in the not only uh, about climate changes we have seen in the past, but also being that, that uh, leading force in making sure that being a freedom zone for LGBTQI community is not only empty words, as Ralph said, but it's actually something that is meaningful and that ensure people to be able to be themselves, as Bianca was saying before. Thank you so much uh, to everyone for being part of the conversation and to our speakers for their very, very interesting, insightful uh, um, comments. Now I'm going to give uh, back the floor to Andre for our last word, but thank you so much, everyone. Yes, Beatrice, thank you very much for, for that uh, great moderation in today's webinar. And I would uh, first like to thank our very distinguished speakers for all their contributions today. Uh, you've made some, some very, very good uh, points, and I hope that uh, they will have reverberations inside the decision-making uh, processes in the Commission and in the member states in order for all of us to work for a more inclusive and uh, for a better world. And uh, yes, yeah, so Ralph, Bianca, thank you very, very much for that. I also want to thank uh, MEP Ramona Sugariu for uh, sending us that video message. And I know that she's a, she's a very strong supporter of the LGBTI community and uh, we're very happy to, uh, to work with her on that as well. Um, I'll always said, and I, I hope that I hope that our uh, participants who joined us today, and I hope that people who will watch the recordings uh, later will uh, will will take some lessons and will uh, will build new bridges uh, into the future for that. Uh, and talking about the future, uh, the next on the agenda will not be uh, on the third of June as it was supposed to be. It will be on the tenth of June, because on the third of June the European Liberal Forum is organizing. Uh, one of our uh, big flagship events, it's called the uh, Science Not Fiction, uh, Digital Innovation. It will be, uh, it would be a very, very uh, interactive and on the keep you on the feet kind of uh, conference where we will look at the solutions of tomorrow and how to make the fiction of tomorrow into the science of today. So keep your eyes uh, open, check the ELF website for more events science non fiction on 3rd of June, and we will be back with a new webinar from On the Agenda series on 10th of June, looking at what will be on the agenda of the European leaders or what will be left out of the agendas uh, of the European leaders for one reason or another. And with that, I would like to thank you again very, very much. Thank you, everybody. Wish you a very, very nice uh, afternoon and uh, end of the week. And just in case you're watching Eurovision, today is the second semifinal. So have fun with that <laughs> if, you're, if you're a fan. <laughs> so thank you very, very much and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.